All right, so today we are working on conditional statements, flow control decisions, chapter 13. So there's a file that we're going to download, foodinspections.xlsm, and something too special about it is that we need some data to be able to make some decisions about. So go ahead and get that file downloaded, and let's take a look at it. So just to kind of orient ourselves with the data, what we have here are records of uh, inspections from restaurants in the city of Chicago. So inspection date, February of this year, kind of inspection, did they pass the inspection, latitude and longitude of the establishment, and that's the data. So it's kind of boring data, really. Do you really? Yeah. yeah. The interesting part of this data set, which we don't have here today, is when it uh, when you get the notes of the inspector. You know, when you can kind of see what the inspector is saying and when they fail, what did they fail on? Uh, that is uh, makes you want to cook at home a little more often. Okay, so let's open the code window. Oh, I think when you open this, there's going to be an error because when I cut out the example I was working on, I left the end sub in there. So you can delete that end sub, or you can type a sub in front of it because we're going to have something to work with. So sub, um, let's just call it if versions. So we've played around with the if statement already several times, and then we're going to kind of see all of it in its great glory. So finally, oh finally, Wednesday we're going to cover loops. But of course, since we've got a bunch of data here, we're going to have to have a loop here to work with today. So let's just go ahead and start out by setting ourselves a simple do loop. We declare a variable r as an input, use it as a long integer. Just r is short for row, so we control which row we're on. r equals 2, and we'll do until. Let's hmm. yeah, do this. Let's declare a variable up here. Let me give s as a worksheet. <coughs> We've done this very often. So, to kind of re refresh our memories about very our memory about variables and data types. I mean, we've had general confidence since then, so we've had to cram a whole lot more information in there. And some of these variable data types might have been pushed off to the side. So, just throw out some data types to me. Somebody give me a data type. Just yell it out. Boolean, integer. That it? Bones, remember? Object. Object. Object when we're coming to string. Short. Decimals, not, uh, not decimal, there's longs, long integer. For decimals, if you have decimals, they have two kinds. What are they? Float. <coughs> not float. Short. Not short. Single and double. So single precision floating point number, double precision floating point number. You'll be much better at this by the midterm because that's one thing you don't want to take. There's also for decimals, we have currency, which is a fixed point number, uh, and object. So object is when. All those other ones that we talked about, they just hold a single value. They hold a number, or they hold a collection of characters. Object variables allow us to get a reference to some other object. Object's complex. It has, it's almost like having lots of variables built into it. And it can have you know, methods built into it as well. So I can, I can call properties with like having a bunch of variables, and methods which are instructions to do. <clears throat> and, but the object variable itself is just a reference to the object. So all the object variable holds, it holds the address, the, the memory address, for where that object is in memory. So there's already in memory, loaded up, there is an object for this worksheet, the food inspections worksheet. It's already there. It's in memory. All I have to do, if I want to refer to it with an object variable, is connect to it. And that's what I want to do right here. So S, I'm just, just to make my code a little bit shorter and easier to type and easier to read, instead of typing worksheets, food inspections, every time I want to refer to that sheet, we can do that once and bind it down to a variable with a shorter name. That'll just be s. Here's how we do it. Set s equal to, and then a reference to the worksheet. Worksheets, and the name of the worksheet is food inspection. Yeah, I'll, I'll remind you about that set here in just a minute. Food inspection, yeah. It's not case sensitive, so food inspections, uppercase, lowercase, whatever. So normally, when we're just assigning a value to a variable, we could just say the name of the variable equals something. But let's let's do this. You leave it as dim s as worksheet. By the way, 
This is an object variable. So an object variable is just a reference to an object in memory somewhere. But I can tell it what kind of object it's allowed to connect onto just by giving it the type. It's a range, or it's a worksheet, or it's a workbook, or it's a shape, or any other object type. What's the one variable type that I can use to do anything with? Variant. Let me just do this. I'll do variant from there. Then, well, I'll do it as a different variant. Uh, so what was this worksheet? Um, M V as variant. What I'm trying to do, I'm explaining, I'm trying to explain to you why we have to use that keyword set. So let's do this. Let's say V equals range A1. Looking at this syntax, what is the interpreter? Assume we want to do. What's the interpreter going to do? There's two, there's two options by looking at this. Number one, it could say, oh, I just want V to behave like a string and put into it whatever value is in A1, which is inspection ID. That would be a valid way to read that line, don't you think? In fact, I'm going to put a breakpoint here. I'm going to run the code to that point, and then I'm just going to print out V. That's exactly what it does. Print out V, it goes, oh, inspection ID. The reason that this happens is because when you're inventing the language, they said, we, want, we don't want to be so picky about you having to write everything. We want to try to figure out what you mean, even if you forget to put the property. So if you just say something equals range A1, when they wrote the language, they think the most, the most likely thing for that is that you mean the value of A1. Ranges have a default property. If I don't specify the property, it would be a perfectly reasonable thing for the interpreter to do to say, you didn't give me a property, I don't know what to do with it. This interpreter doesn't do that. This interpreter says, you didn't give me a property, I'm going to guess at the property you probably meant. And so it has a default property. <clears throat> and so here's a reference, this is a reference to an object. When the interpreter looks at that, it goes, hmm, I'm going to assume you a property. And so, Imagine if what we really wanted to do was we wanted to bind that this variable to the range itself. Not to pull the value, but to be a reference to the range. The way I tell it that is I have to tell it set. So set is a keyword that just says, all right, interpreter, you think you're going to guess at what I'm trying to do here? Forget about it. I know what I'm doing. I know this so well, I know what the keyword set is for. And when I use the keyword set, don't be guessing. Then I think I want some other property. I really am talking about a reference to this object. So now what this will do is this will bind this variable onto that object. Well now, I mean it's a variant, so we can do whatever we want. But this is now going to be an object variable. It's just a reference to that range. So I'm going to run this again up to that point. And now I can, it's a reference to that variable, so I can ask it like information about the object. Uh, dot value. If I do this without the set, and I try to ask it for the value, it's going, doesn't even make any sense. It's just a string. You, you, you totally put a string into it. And so that's, that's the difference. The reason we have to use the keyword set is because there's this notion of a default property. Now, I don't know of any default property for a worksheet. So you might think it could figure it out, but that's not the case. If you, if you want to connect up an object variable to an object, you have to use the keyword set. Question? What would happen if you did D equals range A1 dot of dress? Right. Is if I did that right here? Yeah. Dot of yeah, dot of dress. Is that doing the same thing? Okay, so we have to answer this question, we have to, we have to understand how, what does this evaluate to right now? So remember, because V is a variant, how it behaves depends on the context. So the question is, what data type is the address of a range? Yeah, the address of a range is a string. And so this is going to behave just like a string. So now if I try to, if I just print V, it'll come back just print v, it will come back with the address. If I try to print v.value, <coughs> the 
we're saying, what are you talking about? It's a string. There's no prop strings don't have properties. It's just a it's just a value. Question. How do you set the breakpoint? Oh, how do I set that breakpoint? I know we've gone over this before, but I didn't try. It's magical. So you've got this kind of gray bar over here on the left. If you just click in the margin about where that line is, that turns that breakpoint. I mean, the first time I ever set a breakpoint, it was like, oh my gosh, what have I done? I clicked it again, it went away, and I went. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so I'm not really doing anything with this. It was just to kind of explain to you the reason that we have to use set. The whole point here is that set says I'm binding an object variable onto an object. The whole point is that now we can use S just as if it were the full reference to the worksheet. Here's what happens. When I say worksheets, food inspections like this, the interpreter looks at that and has to figure out, what the heck is he talking about? Oh, worksheets collection. It looks through it and finds that worksheet. Oh, that's the worksheet. And it goes, ah, it gets a reference to the worksheet that I'm talking about. All I'm doing is saying, you know what, do that once and remember that. And so now, instead of having to look it up each time, it just knows, oh, yeah, S is already bound onto that. So now I can do until s, which is a reference to the worksheet, dot cells, row number r, column number one, dot value is equal to a zero length string. I always, there's, anytime I made a loop, so I'm always a little worried that I might put myself into an endless loop that might be kind of hard to get out of. And so what do I want to put in here? Two events. It just says, hey, listen every once in a while in case I'm trying to interrupt you. And then something to control the loop, r equals r plus 1. So the first time through, r will be 2. We'll start here, we'll check, hey, are we, uh, what's the value of that worksheet, our food inspection worksheet, row number 2, column number 1, is it blank? And if this evaluates to true, then we're done. It's not blank because row number 2 has some value in it. It's an inspection ID. And so we'll do whatever we're doing. So just to make sure I've got my loop working right, I'm going to do a debug.print. Quick question, the do events, what does that do exactly? So do events, so to, to understand do events, you have to realize that when I put myself into a loop, that computer is just like running that loop as fast as it possibly can. So fast, it's like it puts its head down and says, don't bother me, I'm running this loop. And I'm not even going to listen. Don't even, don't even try to talk to me because I'm going to, if you talk to me, I'm not even going to listen because I'm so busy running this loop. The do event says one time each through the loop, stop right here for a moment, and just take a break, look around. Is somebody trying to do something else right now, like update the screen or, or update the screen, really the only thing I can think of that we ever actually use it for, or someone's trying to break into the code, trying to send an escape key or clicking on the stop button up here. It'll, Pause long enough to check to see if anything is, is sitting around waiting to be done, and then it'll, it'll do it. <sighs> okay. So now if I run that, it should just hmm, it should just run off all those ideas. Oh darn it. It's loop, not next. We'll talk about next next time. Yeah, next is a different is the end is the ending keyword for a different kind of loop. And maybe I'll also print off R just so I can see the row number that we're talking about. So R comma. 77 rows. So 76 rows of data. Rows 2 through 77. And that's the data that I need. Okay. So just the background to get us going with what we're trying to do with understanding the if statement. Questions on getting set up where we are right here? Yes. So I set mine up like you did, but it says object required. So I like pretending to be. <coughs> object required. Object required. Let's take a look real quick. <laughs> 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 Let me explain, let me show you what you've done. Let me show what you've done just so the class can benefit. 
So right now, if we look up here, I've got v equals range a1 dot address. This is totally separate from the example that I'm doing. It was to kind of talk about this. So right now, v is a variant. And so it can behave either like a object or a string or whatever. So if I come in here, if I want to make it behave like an object, I want to put the keyword set in here, which is what you have on your code. So now the problem is, if I say set v equal to something, whatever is over here has to be an object. And this isn't an object. What is it? What type is this expression? Yeah, it's a string. And so to make your code work, you either have to take off the word set, or you have to get rid of address. Either one will get that executing. They'll do very different things, but because I'm not relying on this for the rest of the example, it doesn't matter which one that you do. Uh, so I know you tried running and you got an error that said the uh, compile error in next to have four. And I think you fixed something. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't, I didn't catch it. The, so I put, I accidentally, you know, just from force of habit, I tried to type blue. I told my fingers, type blue. And they typed next. Next is the ending keyword for a different kind of loop that we'll talk about on Wednesday. So I should kill that next. Get rid of next and put it replace it with blue. Sorry. Uh, What's the worst than your instructor showing you the wrong way? It's like putting the wrong way on a test and then not giving you the points back when you did it the right way on the test. That would be worse. I mean, once as a student, the professor just said, you know, your score is high enough without those points to deal with. <laughs> okay. It was high enough. We don't have time. <laughs> All right. So now here's the idea. So now inside the meaty part of this loop, I want to do some stuff with the if statement. So let's do this. So the idea is we're going to be running through all of this data. Let's just say what I'd like to do is I would like to notice when someone failed. Where's fail? Okay. So over here in column M, <coughs> we have pass, pass with conditions, or fail, or out of business, or no entry. So um, whenever this says fail, I want to do something. So we're looking through all this data. So we'll put an if statement. If, now I have to have some condition. So whatever I put between the if and the then has to evaluate to either true or false. So I want to look at column M. It is column M. J is 10. J, K, L, T, or K, L, M. Oh, it looks like 13. Or, so I can put 13 here to refer to that, se that cell, or I can put a capital M in here, or lowercase m for that matter. Okay, so this right now isn't a Boolean expression, right? Boolean means true or false. What kind of expression is this? It's a string, yeah, it's just, a, it's just whatever is in, the, whatever's in that cell. And so, whew, I need to convert that string into a Boolean expression. And I want it to be either true or false whenever what I'm seeing there is equal to fail. So I'm going to say that equals fail. So now I have a Boolean expression. If I think about how this is going to be evaluated, <coughs> this is case sensitive. That's correct. But by default, when I, when I compare strings, one string to another, um, case sensitive. A little bit weird because when I'm looking up the name of a worksheet, the, works, the, the code that runs behind this worksheet's object says, you know what, I'm going to ignore case. But just comparing strings doesn't. Okay, so as I think about how this gets evaluated, the interpreter has to look at this and say, well, what is this? And at, at, its, at the point of life when it's running, it says, well, what is to, to know that? i got to know what R is. And so it goes, oh, R is 2. First time through, R is going to be 2. And then it's like, oh, okay, I get it. So R is 2. What is, what is this value when R is 2, by the way? So then it looks at this and it goes, okay, I got to understand what this means. It goes out and looks at the worksheet. So what property do I want with the value? What sheet? That gets that all figured out. <laughs> it goes like this. Kind of converts it down in its mind, in its little computer mind. It converts that down to the value that's there. And then it's looking at this expression. That's a Boolean expression. This equals that. That is either true or false. What is it? 
That's false. And so, as we're getting to this if statement right here, it looks at this, it goes through all those steps to evaluate that down, and it goes, that is false. Now, because it's false, oh, we have to, we have to get the rest of our structure instead of here. Let's look at the very simplest form of the if statement, and that is just a one-line if statement. So let's say if, it, if it's actually that color, then we want to change a property of that cell. Instead of changing the value, I want to change the background color. So to get to that, it's interior dot color equals, I'm going to pick a number between 1 and 16 million, um, 240. I don't know what color 240 is. I think it's probably close to red. Yeah. Why do you always have to put interior before color to change one of the lines? Aha! Look, color seems like such a nice word. Wouldn't it be better if we could just say that cell dot color? And the answer is there is no property called color of a cell. So a cell <laughs> has a property called interior, which has all of the properties that describe the interior. It has the, the background color, which is just called color. It has the background pattern, which is called pattern. It has the color of the background pattern, which is called pattern color. And it has a bunch of other properties. In fact, let's just see if we can figure out what it is. Now, the truth is that the, the editor here can't always figure out what object we're talking about, especially when we go, we go out here, oh, wow, this is, a, this is an object variable. I'm not really sure the interpreter, not the interpreter, but the editor is going, I'm not really sure we know what's going on here. But if we have something declared a little more clearly for it, like dim uh, rng or cell, C-E-L-L, -L, as a range, and now we say cell dot, then it goes, oh, I know, this is a range. So it's a little trick that I do, you know, when I'm programming, if I want to get kind of quick access to see what are all the properties for that, and it's not showing up way out here, I don't think it did, did it? When I was out here and I just hit that dot, hit dot, yeah, I didn't come with any help. But if, I, if I've got a more cleanly declared variable, dot, okay, let me go to, um, these are all the properties. Look, there's lots and lots of properties and ranges. Those are properties and methods, right? The little green things, the method, the other properties. One of these is called interior. And it's got a bunch of properties, not as many, but it's got a bunch as well. And so I think part of this, when they're designing, deciding how this is going to work, I said, well, look, you know, can we kind of, group these into groups, uh, and then we can kind of treat those groups as a set and refer to them as a set. So, so yeah, the reason that we have to say interior here is because range has a property called interior, it is itself an object, and it has a property called color, and that's how we work. So now, let's just go ahead, how far do we have to go down before we get to a fail? Ooh, it's like not. You know what? Sorry, whoever is up here on row number three. I am going to, I'm going to make row number three fail, just for this example. Probably someone's going to watch the video, and it's going to be this company who are they? It's going to be the El Topico Mexican Grill, and they're going to be, you said we failed our inspection, and now we're going to sue. Okay, don't sue me, sue the universe for the act money. Okay, so the point is, our first time through this loop, we're going to, it's going to evaluate this. The second time in the loop, it's going to look at this one to evaluate. So I want to go through this step by step and do that. So I'm going to set a breakpoint here on R equals 2. You know, I think you can just like step into this by hitting F8, but I'm just going to set that breakpoint. That takes me right to there. And then I'm going to F8 to step through this. So F8 will go one line at a time. All right, so we're checking the condition. Is this expression going to evaluate true or false? This is going to be false, and so we keep going. All right. So right here, we're, we're check. I can actually copy this right here, bring it to my immediate window. I can just print that expression. I can peek at it. Yeah, that's false. That's what I expected. Because what does what is this equal right now by itself? False. Yeah, this is pass. And so when I ask if that is equal to false, or if that is equal to fail, the answer is false. So when I hit F8, it's not going to come over here. It's the whole purpose of the if statement is to say, okay, that says this thing evaluates to false. 
we skip the rest of this line. So I hit F8 and it just goes right on to the next, the next state. Cool. Keep F8, it's going to add one to R, back up to the top, checks that condition, it's still false. Now we're checking this again. If I ask for this, evaluate this now, aha, now it's true. So if I execute that line, it's going to say, oh, now we go over here. It's the whole point of a conditional statement. Is it based on that condition, true or false, the code branches. It goes one way or another. And this is the simplest form of the if statement. Condition, and then one single line. In the early days of basic, that's the only version of the if we had. If you want to do multiple lines, you put an if statement in front of each one. Or you did an if, and you branch down to some other block that would execute as a result. It's hideous. Unless it was the 80s. There were lots of things that were working. Yeah. Do you think scroll just a little bit? No. But what I will do is close that window. Now you've got it all. Let's see if I can get rid of some of this. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this variable that we didn't need just because it's keeps, uh, making things a little bit bigger than it needs to be. Okay. Now, okay, so that's that is one that's one version. So that's single line if statement. So let's look at another one. What else should we do? Any other suggestions? What should we look at? Well, what do I do? Oh, I was saying the color. What color did I say? <coughs> oh, I never said it because I think I didn't actually execute it. So let me I'm going to take the breakpoint off and run the whole thing. And that should set the background color for every cell that has fail in column M. There's color number 240. And sure enough, everywhere it says fail, it's set it to red. Questions? Okay, next version of the if statement lets us do a block. So if, I'll just put the syntax in, then we'll come and put the details. If, then, so now we can say, listen, we can have a pot load of lines that we execute here. So we have to tell it when to stop. <coughs> but how many of these lines are going to execute conditionally? And so we give it a keyword end if here. And then whatever lines we have in here are the ones that are executed conditionally. So for this one, why don't we look, why don't we put a different color for everything that is a high risk. So if it equals risk one high, what column is that risk in? Uh, F. Column F? Yes. All right. So now, if the risk is high, we're going to do something. What should we do? Well. For setting background colors, let's go ahead and set some background colors. And I'm going to set the interior dot color. By the way, if you want to kind of build the color up from its components, red, green, and blue, RGB, there's a function, RGB, and then you give it a number between 0 and 255. So if you want it to be really blue, I would say RGB. 0 red, 0 green, and a whole bunch of blue. This, by the way, just evaluates to a number. So if I print that off, it says, oh yeah, there's 16 million, well there's more than 16 million. This is 16 million, 711,608. That's what color that is. So ultimately we have to get to that number index that we're, that number that we're giving it. But the RGB function just takes the components and brings back that number. So the whole point here is that I want to be able to do two things. So I want to set the interior color. No, I set the interior color now. I want to set the color of the font. So font.color. And let's set that to be white. White is a whole bunch of everything. Incidentally, there are some constants that are pre-built for us around colors in VBA. So, color number 16,777,215 is white. But they made a constant for that. VB white. It's the same number. It's white, so 
the other one. So we could replace this with VB white. VB white sounds like some kind of author of children's books. <coughs> by VB white. It's a story you won't want to miss. And then let's do one more thing while we're at it. And we're going to set the font dot bold to true. Anytime you have a white lettering on a dark background, it's a little bit hard to read unless it's bold. So now, do we want to step through this or should we just run it and see what it does? Just run it. So now every time we have a high risk, wow, a lot of high risks here. A risky place. We got medium, we got blank, we got low. Yeah, there's at least one low. So the whole point for the block if is that I can execute an arbitrary set of lines. Or many other questions here? Okay, so now if I have a block if, so what I'm about to do is not available on a single line if statement. But if I have a block if, I can say, okay, listen, if this is true, here's, a, I mean, look at this condition, and if it's true, here's a block of code to execute if it's true, but now let me give you an alternate block to execute if it's false. And we'll just make this green. What do I do? <clears throat> so now, first thing you have to realize is that when I have an if, block if it has an else clause, then Two things to realize. Number one is that these two blocks of code are mutually exclusive. There is no way for this code to flow through and execute both of those blocks. I really mean no. There's no reasonable way. There might be a really weird thing that we could do to make them both execute. But for the purpose of this class, you could say there's no way. They're mutually exclusive. One of these is going to execute or the other one. And they're, and they're complete. One of them will execute. There's no question about, well, the first one's not going to execute. What is the second one? Well, if the first one doesn't, the second one has to, because they're complete. Right? We, so, so one of those is going to execute, and only one. Yeah. A TA. A TA to the rescue. By the way, how are we doing on the code so far? Anyone else have a code that's not executing? I'm not sure why. Just pause for a second, and uh, just make sure we're all up all right, so, you have, so several of you are having this experience. You're looking at your code, you're going, my code doesn't work, I have no idea why. I have no idea why this code doesn't work. Have you had this experience? You make some change and now all of a sudden, my code is working, and I have no idea why. I, you know, I have forgotten what that experience is like. Uh, until this past weekend, I started developing a new environment called Ionic, and I feel just like you when you're beginning. I'm looking at this code going, what the heck does that mean? I'll copy something and I'll paste it and it won't quite work. I'll change it, it won't quite work. I'll change it again, it'll work. No idea why it wasn't working or why it started working. Anyway, I feel I, 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 I am with you. You know, you're not sure that it's gonna work or not gonna work. Or just you know, it just it's not gonna work and we got that part figured out. Okay. More with credit that works. Okay, so that's like the simple block if. It gets a little more complicated, you ready? So right now, we're always choosing between two colors. I've got three different values here. So I've got high, medium, and low. Hmm. So I just can't live with this green here. I've got to make that a darker green. I don't know how to make a darker green. We add some blue. We can't go high with 25. That's the maximum. Oh, okay. So let's add some blue in here. Let's add in purple, right? Let's add in 100. Uh, seems like it helped a little bit. Let's see what I think. Well, that's going to be. Let's just not make it white. Let's make it. Let's make the color black. Let me get blue with that. Isn't it 
be already black, so you have to set it? Oh, the question is, is this already black? And the answer is, no, white. Well, I mean, this one's black, but that color right now is white. Because you're running it again, it's already okay. Yeah, it's already, I already, my code already changed it to white. It doesn't somehow magically reset back to the way it was before we started running code. You see what happens. But if we were writing this for the first time, we wouldn't think that it changed to black. That's correct. If it were already black, we wouldn't have to change it to black. And I think the goal will make false. Okay, so we've got, we have now high, but medium and low are the same color. So let's go ahead and put low in, in green. So let's do this. What I'm going to do, I'm going to copy this whole else block. I've got the else and all the lines copied. By the way, when you're copying lines of code, a little trick here. Instead of like, you know, going to the end of the line to copy that line, you know, like highlighting all the way to the end over here, what you want to do is go on the very first character of that line and hit the down arrow. Because that takes the line and the character turn character at the end. So when you paste it, it pastes the return with it. So it makes a new line. So I'm going to just go down. I'm arrowing down to get these. And now if I copy and then just hit Control V to paste twice, the first time paste it right over the top of that. And the second time puts the next one in. So Control C, Control V, V will duplicate that block. If you've gone, if you select from the first character and go down. Okay. So here's now another thing I could do. I have another clause. We've seen the if clause. We've seen the else clause. There's one called else if. One word. There's no space between the else and the if. It's else if. I put some new condition here. What condition do I want? Well, this one I want if it's medium. So risk two medium. As bad as I am on the keyboard, I'm not going to try to type that. I'm just going to copy it. So risk. Then we'll make it, you know, that color green wasn't so bad. That is, that is 20 in the last one. If it had a black, if it had black writing, let's try that. So, probably should make it yellow and then blue, but yellow and green. I'll run that code. I kind of like that green. Let me, I'm just going to go ahead and change this bottom one to be yellow. DB yellow. There we go. Those are kind of three distinct ones. So the way it works now, now before we had two blocks here mutually exclusive. Now I have three blocks. These are also mutually exclusive. Only one of these blocks of code is going to execute. So here's the way that. Here's the way that it interprets it. It comes here and it says, is this true? Okay, first of all, is it possible, now I have two conditions in this if structure, is it possible for them both to be true? <laughs> yeah, the ones I have here can't both be true because they're looking at the same value, it's looking at, one, looking at the same cell and it's one value or the other value. But these two conditions could be looking at totally different cells. So could they both be true? Yeah, they, they the condition could both be true. So here's the question. What happens if both of these conditions end up being true? And the answer is, these blocks of code are mutually exclusive. You're only going to get one. So the way that it executes is it comes down here and it says, all right, is this true or false? And if it's true, is what it does. It says, great, I'm going to execute this block. Bing, 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 bing. I hit this else if and I go, aha, I'm done. I don't even look at this expression. I don't care if it's true or false. Because once I've executed my one block of code, I'm done. I hit the else if, I drop to the end if, and I move on. In fact, we could make this one true. I mean, really true. That's always true. True, by the way, is true. I mean, that's true. If this one executes on top of this one, it will replace all that coloring with the coloring that we have here. But it won't. Let's just go ahead and step through it. Put a breakpoint. Um, put a breakpoint here. My R equals two, and I'll run. So F eight. Come along here just fine. Now, 
if this is true, we're going to jump into this block. And it is. So we come into here. That's where I meant to go. Now I'm getting ready. What's my next line that I'm going to hit? <clears throat> Will I even evaluate this line? And the answer is no. I hit F8 and it takes me right to the end end. We wouldn't put that back because I want this to, to go different. This old X, let's see how many do we have to go? Come to the top and see how far we can. We've got a bunch before you agree. I'm going to go ahead and just put some data up here so we can have something to play with. I'm going to put a risk one, a risk two, and then a risk three. And so I've got those three at, right here at the beginning. And let's just watch the code as it executes for this. I'm going to stop it and run again. First time through, it should be. High should be true, so let's get this one. Second time through should be this one. Third time through it should be the third. So let's go ahead and start again. So my first time through, it checks that. That's true. It executes that and jumps out. Back to the top again. That one's not true, so it jumps to this line. Now it has to evaluate this line. That one is true. <coughs> so we execute through that one. We jump out. Third time through. Let me scroll down a bit. Third time through. It's not that one. It checks this one. It's not that one. It gets to the else. And so we execute that one. Yes? What if we made the last else and else if? Ah, uh -huh. we make it up. We have, we have another else if for the low. Sure. I'll go ahead and stop my code here. So now, risk three. Well, I mean, if you didn't add in another else if. Just change the else to an else if. Okay, we'll go there in a second. Yeah. I'll block this other. I'll block the other code. Um, what's this low? Uh, the L has to be capital. Okay. And for low, hmm, I guess this, I guess I like the color we have for low. Oh, that's what you wanted to do. Okay, so let's just go ahead. So to see this, we have to get one more condition here, and that is when it's none of these. Yeah. I'm going to call it risk four. I don't know what risk level four is. What's lower than low? None. none. <laughs> Good. Let me go ahead and clear the coloring off of this. Home. No fill, put this all back to black, and not fill. Kind of back to where we started. And I've set this sheet up now that I've got four different values here. So I think you can see what's going to happen is that when this is true, we have to block for that one. When this is true, we have to block for that one. When this is true, we have to block for this one. Is there ever a block that's true for this one? No. I'm never, I'm never looking for four. And so which of these blocks of code are going to execute for four? None of them. It will, it will never be true on that one. Should we step through it or should we just run it? Whoops. And so we've got the coloring on the first three, and then the fourth one is just as white as it ever was, or as black and white as it ever was. Again, then, we can come and put the else clause in here to pick up all the rest of them. For this one, you know what I haven't worked with in a long time is the interior pattern. So let's put a pattern on there of, I just don't know what patterns I can choose. Five. I don't even know if pattern five is a real thing. Apparently it is. Didn't give me an error. There's pattern five. Ooh. And so anything that's not risk one, two, or three should have those black lines going across it. So here's one that was blank, and it has the black lines. Are there white 
lines on a black background or black lines on a black background? Just only those two. It doesn't matter how far you zoom in, those lines stay the same just as a black line. You just get fewer of them. Questions on the if structure? There's really only one more thing to do to extend this. So the point is, you can have as many else if clauses as you want. You want to have 100 of them? You can do that. Chances are, if you make an, else, an if else block with 100 else ifs, there's a much better way to do whatever it is you're trying to do. But you could. So here's the thing. Uh, it really is an extension. It's just something to realize that this condition can become very complex. Meaning that, um, let's, in fact, let's, let's leave this, this, this example is pretty good the way it is. So let's put another if statement here. And we'll just do it as a, as a small if statement. If some condition, then we'll put else if. By the way, is it legal to do a block if with only one line in it? The answer is sure, yeah. So, you don't have to have multiple lines to change the block if, but so okay, that's what we're doing right here. So now I want to highlight the whole line when I have a high risk failure. So I'm I'm painting these cells, I'm painting these cells. But when I have a high risk failure, I want the whole line to go that color. So I've already got the if here for high. I'm gonna bring that down. And we bring in the if for fail. So now I've got two conditions. Let's think about how VBA is going to actually interpret this expression. I don't want else if, I want end if. In this case, I just want to say s dot rows are dot interior dot color equals, let's make it gray, kind of a light gray. So we'll do like 200 comma 200 s dot row. Oh, yes, s dot, it's s dot row, not color. Oh, thank you. Let's think about how this whole thing gets evaluated. So here's the here's just the if condition on this. So it, as the interpreter's looking at this, it kind of looks across this and goes, "Oh, we got an and here. Wonderful. That means I've got to evaluate this side, and I've got to evaluate this side. So we're going to have a particular line. Let's think about how it, how this will end up getting written out. Say it evaluates the, front, the one in front first. It's going to be like, oh, all right, this one is true. The other one evaluates false. So what does the whole expression evaluate to? That true and false is false. For the and to be true, then they both have to be true. So it doesn't matter which one's false. If either side is false, the whole thing's going to be false. If that is true, then if they're both true, then the whole, then the whole thing will be true. This is just two conditions joined by an and. What else can we do? There are two other operators that we can use with this. What are they? Or, so you can do ands and ors. You can mix it up. This could get long. And the other one? Not. Which just reverses. So, Right, if I have this whole thing, that's false. If I put a not in front of it, then the whole thing is true. The truth is, when I have a not, I really want to see parentheses around it so I can kind of feel what that not is pertaining to, but it doesn't have to be there. Or, true and true. What's this one going to be? Yes. 
So I've got the or here, and so this whole side is going to be, this one's going to be true. So the whole thing, no matter what happens right here, the whole thing's going to be true. Change this to an or in here. Then this side is now true. So now true, what is this? False or true, that's true. So this whole side is false. <coughs> change this one to false. Then this side is false. So this side is true. False or false is? False, so not false or false is true. This is true or true. Let's see, now there's one I don't use very much. There's another one called exclusive or. And that means one side only can be true. So if they're both true, the whole thing's false. It's an exclusive or. One side is true, the other side is false. Doesn't matter which one is which. Um, but you can do that as well. So or and XOR and not. I think there's actually a couple others that are even weird. We'll stick with those. So, here's the point, folks, is that you should feel pretty comfortable writing a condition that has one and or one or in it. But as soon as you get, or, you know, if you've got a bunch of ands or a bunch of ors, feel free to make it as long as you want. As soon as you start mixing ands and ors, you just have to tell yourself, wow, Professor Allen told me something about this, and that is, it's really dangerous. One of the most difficult things for the human processor to process is complex conditions. And so it's, just, it's, it's really tough for us to think through it. So we've got to be careful. The other one is more than two levels of nesting of ifs. And again, that's just a complex condition that's spread out across multiple statements. Question? Um, so you can do more than one and or and or. You can keep them going. Do you just have to use parentheses? You don't have to use parentheses. I mean, if you, if you, yeah, you can to kind of block this whole one has to execute first, or this one. Yeah. Okay. But there's an order of operations okay. to, um, to ands and ors. I can't remember which one. I always put parentheses. I can't remember which one it is. Let's do this one. So if you do parentheses, you'll be safe. Yes. Okay. True or false and true. True or false and true. The pan the seal. If the and happens first, how will this execute? True. This will be true. What do we say? If this happens first, this will be true and true. So if the or happens first, this whole thing will be true. If the and happens first, this whole thing will still be true. There must be a way to write this thing to tell it anyway. Anyway, I don't know if the order of operations is use parentheses. Or Google. I'm sure it says one of these happens with other things. Can you put those on different lines? So if you're if you're nesting ands and ors? Ah, could we do it on different lines? The answer is yes. So, so you do one line is and and then the way we have to do it, of course, with the line continuation character. Okay. So we could come down, down here and put and, and then have some other condition. And that should select this <coughs> dot rows. And so we've given that gray to anyone. What did we say on the condition? If, the, if it was a high risk and they failed, so there's a high risk. Truth is, I want this one to happen before the other block, so it's still kind of like that. So I'm moving that block above the other one so that the fail will still be in red on that line. The whole row. No, you still need the, your if the fail is the line above. Oh, thank you. Didn't move it up. So now I still have the coloring on the cell that I wanted to color. 
all the rest of the ones have uh, that gray to indicate it's a high risk one. Questions on if? Do we really spend an hour talking about this statement? Let's look at another version of branching. So a different kind of statement that does branching as well. <coughs> Subcase. All right, so the thing about the if statement is that, the, or the else if clauses, is that each one of these comparisons is totally independent from each other. The first one stands, stands by itself, either true or false. The next one we look at, it could be looking at something totally different, but it stands by itself. It's really common for us to say we're looking at one variable or one cell, and we want to know is it this, or is it this, or is it this, or is it this? And that's what the case statement or the select statement is for. So let's call this select. Demo. We use the keyword case in the select, but it really is a select statement. I'm going to go ahead and copy. I want my loop. I'm just going to actually copy the whole guts out of the other one and then get rid of everything on the inside of the loop. I know that's going to be kind of confusing, but let me just have this whole thing showing so you can get the loop. So this then is just how we started the last one before we put all the if statements in the belly of the loop. So now we have several kinds of, what is this, inspection type, short form complaint, canvas, canvas reinspection, complaint, whatever. And so we're going to do one that looks, that expressly recognizes that I'm looking at one value and then comparing to see what it is. Here's the, here's the basic syntax. Starts with select, ends with end to select. So there's the, the book ends for it. We then tell it, what are we going to look at? What's the one expression that we're going to look at and compare all the rest of these things to? And so we say case, and then we put what we're looking at. That is column L. So cells column L. I'm looking at the value of whatever row I'm on, column L. And now I'm going to have multiple clauses inside of this select that says if it's one thing, do this. If it's another thing, do this. If it's another thing, do this. Here's how I say it. Again, I use the, the, the same word, case. And then I just put what is it equal to? Well, uh, short form complaint is one of them. <coughs> There's like three of them. I'm just going to bring these over for me to work with. So if that's equal to short form complaint, we'll do one thing. Let me just go ahead and put these other cases right in here. Canvas reinspection. And I've got just a canvas. And so now in between each one of these little blocks, I can do what I want to do in each one of these spaces. So it's a short form complaint. Hmm, what's new? Is there anything you do besides setting the color? We can set the borders, but borders are kind of ugly to set. <coughs> Let's just change the font color. So that particular cell that I'm after, dot font dot color equals BB blue. or red, or blue. We have an else clause, just like we have in the if statement, that if none of the ones before it are executed, then this one will be the, I don't know what I have to choose from, orange. 
So we're going to make it yellow. Also make the background different color. So now this this structure. First of all, can I do anything with the select case statement that I could not also do with the if else if structure? Is there anything that lets me do that I can't do with the other? The answer is no. I can do everything with the if, else if, else if, else if that I can do with the case. So why use the case? Why use this one? It's the branching logic. What's that? The branching logic. It's, it's, it's a case is this, do this. Well, it's exactly, but it's exactly the same. If I think about the one down here, if this is true, do this. If this is true, do this. So it's the same thing up here. Can you do our own? But, but now, what's that? Can you do our own? Oh, can I do an and? I have never tried to do an and. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to do an and with strings, but with numbers you have a little more flexibility. And I think the answer is yes, we can put an and clause here. So it will compare for equality here, and will compare for equality here. If I'm using numbers, I can do like greater than or less than as well over here in the case. Which uh, we may do here in just a minute. Let's go ahead and run this. Oh, DB Green. There's no DB Green? Oh, there's no DB Green. <laughs> oh, it's case else. Case else. Is coloring on that particular thing. I know. Questions here? Let's look at another version of the case statement, which lets us do some more things because we're using numbers. So for numbers, we can do something based on the latitude and we'll understand. give us something to do with how far north and south it is. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. Uh, these are all in Chicago, so north and south should be longitude number. Let me just quickly see what our maximum minimum values are. Our maximum number is that Our minimum number is that. <clears throat> okay. So we can now say select, and this one is what well, I don't want longitude. I guess we do longitude. Longitude is east and west, right? So this is, these are east and west numbers. So select column O. So we're looking at column O this time. Now we can say case is greater than. And then let's just put an 87 column. <coughs> oh, wait a minute. These are negative numbers. So I want if it's less than negative 87.9. We'll do one thing. 87.8, 87.7. Let's just go ahead and color these as well.
So we're now comparing to see if this value, the value that's here, if it is less than that number, it does one thing. Otherwise, if it's less than this one, <coughs> how many of these are true now? Can we think of a value that has more than one of these to be true? Yeah, does 87.6? It's 87. Yeah, it's 87.95. It's less than this, and it's less than that. They're all true. But still, only one is going to execute. So now the color that we've got here gives us some sense as to how far east or west that particular location is. We can say if it is greater than and is or is less than and is greater than eighty-seven point six. Check on this. So you can put a range in here by giving it one number to another number. You won't notice anything different because I already painted those in a particular color. So in any case else. To get rid of the color, all the color off of that, I do interior dot pattern pattern <coughs> color index. I can set the, the color index to none, and that will get rid of the color. So far as I know, there's no color that I can set. There's nothing I can set the color to to make the color go away. With the color index. Now we've got some that are white or with no color on them, and then we have our other colors for these two So if we've got numbers involved, then we can do ranges greater than less than, as well as equality. We have equality. So any other branching? Any other additional branching? This is it. We're only two statements. In the case with a select statement, and you've got the if statement. We now cover them in more detail. Questions? All right. Thanks for coming. Class dismissed.